All right, welcome everyone to this next seminar. So today we've got Marta Marie Marchis from the University of Siegen. She's currently a postdoctoral researcher in the group of Stefan and Richter working on the interface of um, optomechanical systems and gravity and um, what can be sensed with optomechanical systems, either features of quantum gravity or um, or other tests of fundamental physics. And so today she's talking about coherently average optomechanical sensing. So when you're ready, Marta. Uh, thanks, German, uh, for giving me the chance to, to present this work. Um, and thanks for the introduction. So uh, today I want to present you this work uh, with the title uh, Currently Average Optomechanical Sensing. And uh, I'm going to, to explain like uh, uh, each of the of the words of this title uh, very soon. So uh, before I start, I just want to give you the outline of this talk. Um, I want to divide it in, in, uh, in, in four different parts. Um, initially, I want to present the setup. So I want to present the optomechanical, uh, a generic optomechanical system and how this can be used uh, for sensing application. And in particular, uh, I think it will be good to start with some uh, motivation uh, in the sense of uh, uh, what can we test um, with these uh, uh, sensors. So I would like to discuss a bit of the physical effect uh, that we aim to detect with the uh, uh, optomechanical platforms. And uh, the second point uh, that I would like to, to move after uh, is uh, about announcement. So um, there are ways to get some announcement uh, in uh, uh, the detection of uh, signals, announcement in the sensitivity. And um, I, I just want to focus on the one we are using here. So that is uh, this coherent average scheme. And then uh, uh, I would like to uh, show uh, two specific cases that uh, um, we we looked at. So I will present the uh, specific system that we are using, namely uh, it's uh, a series of optomechanical cavities that they will be coupled together. And uh, uh, the goal is to to detect some unknown effect using uh, these multiple cavities. And uh, the two cases we looked at so, so far is, uh, um, first of all, the simple case when, for example, uh, we just have a classical signal that we hang to measure. So there is like a classical uh, noise that, we, that is affecting all the optomechanical system. And uh, uh, we want to see how the sensitivity scales uh, in this case when we increase the number of sensors. And then uh, the more complete case is when we also introduce quantum noise. And this will be when we include also uh, thermal uh, noise and uh, light back action. And uh, at the end, I will just like uh, draw some conclusion and uh, sum up uh, uh, this work. Um, so uh, feel free to ask uh, questions anytime, uh, anytime you want. Uh, okay. So, um, an optomechanical uh, system is uh, uh, generally a sketch like that. So, um, can you see also my pointer uh, at the moment? I think so, right? Um, I can't see the pointer. You can or cannot? I can't. No? Oh, then now I can. Okay. So, um, when we talk about optomechanical system, the most prototypical example that we have in mind is when we uh, have two mirrors uh, in front of each other. One of the two is movable because it is attached to a spring. And it is movable because when we uh, inject some light in the cavity, uh, then uh, because of the uh, radiation pressure force, the light impinging on the mirror Will, um, will transfer some momentum and the mirror will start to move. Now, um, this uh, particular interaction is what makes this system uh, kind of special uh, because 
um, the interaction between the quantum degrees of freedom of the light and the mechanical uh, mirror, that is also called mechanical resonator, can generate entanglement between these two parts. And this allows for the creation of non-classical states of the mirror. And this is one of the interesting features of this system. Uh, moreover, it is possible to cool down uh, the mechanical uh, resonator such that uh, uh, its motion uh, will enter the quantum regime. And both these two features um, are uh, particularly interesting and they find uh, a lot of application in, uh, for example, exploring the foundation of quantum physics, uh, but also for sensing application. In the sense that, uh, let's imagine we have uh, an unknown signal that uh, we don't know where it is. We just know that it acts as an external force on the mechanical mirror. Then uh, um, the, the mirror is oscillating because of the light. And uh, if there is uh, this unknown uh, force affecting uh, the, the, the mirror, then uh, the motion will be modified. And uh, um, the whole point of using these uh, systems as sensors then is to try to, uh, first of all, to measure the modification of the mechanical motion that are caused by this unknown signal. Uh, but then the most challenging part is to distinguish uh, this signal from the other source of noise. So let's say that we have to take into account also like uh, all other possible uh, uh, noise sources. This they will also modify the motion of the mechanical mirror. And then you will have a, a total force acting on the mirror that consists of uh, different contribution. So on one side, you will have your uh, uh, the force you want to detect, the, the signal you want to measure, but you have to be able to distinguish it from the background. And this is usually very challenging because the probably the force you want to look at is uh, uh, very, very small and extremely weak. So, uh, but what kind of force are we talking about? Let's uh, start uh, giving some examples. And in particular, I want to present uh, three cases that we think uh, we could apply uh, our, um, uh, our setup. So um, the first example could be uh, testing gravity in a relativistic regime. This would be, of course, extremely interesting and in general, uh, um, the, the main problem of testing gravity in uh, such a regime is that an ex experimentalist uh, do not have access to the, to, the, to the cosmic source of the signal. So this makes this kind of uh, uh, experiment uh, a bit difficult. Um, in the, by test gravity in the relativistic regime, um, what examples of specific tests do you have in mind? Um, so I don't have a, in mind uh, something specific. I mean, in our case, uh, we would like to uh, uh, test the, the gravitational field mm -hmm. to have a measure of it. But for example, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in this paper that I'm um, uh, cited here, um, it could be um, what they do is to... Um, to measure what they measure in the end is the acceleration of a test particle. Mm. So, um, so, like the acceleration of a relativistically accelerated, so the gravitational field of a relativistically accelerated test particle, for example. Or, uh, I mean, you source a gravitational field that is sourced by relativistic particles, right? And you use another mass to test this field. Yeah. Okay. The mass doesn't have to be relativistic. I think the the test one. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, for example, um, to, to, to enter this regime, uh, people have started uh, thinking how to uh, create and detect uh, a gravitational field uh, in the relativistic regime, but in a lab. And the example I, I bring you here is uh, the Large Hadron Collider, where essentially we have like a... Um, uh, um, a ring where there are some uh, uh, proton bunches that are allowed to circulate in this ring 
uh, with high uh, velocity, with high speeds. Then this particle uh, will, uh, will be treated as a relativistic uh, particle beams, and this they can be used uh, as a source of gravitational field. So um, the, the effect that you will that you expect to, to come out of this uh, of this source is essentially that uh, these uh, bunches of particles uh, will generate uh, um, an oscillating gravitational field. This will be reflected in uh, an oscillating curvature of the space-time. And to test this, you can, uh, as I was uh, saying before, you can, for example, take a test particle, let it fly around uh, this uh, space-time, and see and try to measure the acceleration that this particle will be subjected. And uh, just to give you some numbers of the, um, mm, I mean, about what we are talking about. So, and why uh, we would also to motivate the reason why we would like to use this uh, to detect the gravitational field. Um, uh, so, from a relativistic uh, perspective, um, a particle beam behaves exactly like a laser beam. Because the, um, um, the contribution coming from the rest mass of the protons are negligible in this regime. And then you can approximate the um, uh, energy momentum relationship in this way. So just like uh, E equals uh, C to P, where P is the momentum of the proton uh, in, in the same way as it would be for uh, photons. Um, and what so in, in, what would we have in this system? In this system, uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, bunches of protons, uh, so around uh, more than two thousand bunches of protons, and they uh, run in a in a ring that is extremely long. It's like twenty six uh, uh, point uh, six hundred fifty nine meters, and uh, they run uh, in, on on speed with a speed that is very close to the speed of light. So. Each bunch uh, of proton has a hundred joule energy, and they are also uh, long in the sense that they are thirty centimeters long. And then we can say we can we also know that there are like uh, uh, ten to the eleven uh, protons in each of these bunch. So in general, um, the um, the pulse power of the LHC beam. Uh, is smaller if we compare it to other um, laser pulses. Um, but the thing is that uh, um, the average pulse, so since the, the proton bunches are much longer, uh, then this will result in an average um, in an average power that is uh, uh, stronger than any other similar experiment. So any other uh, um, experiment that uh, use uh, laser pulses and they want to generate uh, like a gravitational field in the relativistic regime. So in this sense, um, it might be more useful to have a look at uh, LHC to source uh, gravitational field in the um, ultra-relativistic regime because the average uh, power is higher than other sources. So, for example, a, a laser that you can trap in a cavity and you can make them oscillating, or also um, um, a CV laser in a, in a cavity. So, um, this is the one of the effects we want to we would like to detect. Uh, another uh, example could be, for example, to investigate dark matter. In dark matter, it is, uh, it is uh, still nowadays uh, kind of a mysterious topic because uh, we know there are uh, a lot of astrophysical and cosmological uh, observation that point uh, in the direction of uh, the existence of dark matter. And in particular, um, uh, we expect that uh, roughly 23% of the universe should be made by dark matter. But what is dark matter? Actually, we still don't know. And we even don't know what's the possible mass for such candidates. So the, the range of the mass for these uh, candidates span from a uh, few, uh, 10 to the minus 20 electron volt over C square, 
up to uh, hundreds of solar masses. So the, the range is, uh, is, is extremely unconstrained. And this makes uh, uh, the test and the search of this particle also uh, a big challenge. Because according to the, the model of dark matter you, you want to detect, you might need a different experimental setup. So a different system to detect either small masses or large ones. And uh, um, for, the, for the purpose of optomechanical system, I think it's, um, it's particularly nice to look at the ultralight dark matter. So uh, when we speak about ultralight dark matter, we usually refer for candidates that have a mass confined between, uh, I mean, lower than one electron volt over C square. So in, in, in this regime, we expect the dark matter to have very, very low mass and high occupancy number. So the behavior of these candidates will be essentially uh, like, um, like a, an oscillating wave, a coherent source that will produce an oscillating background of ultralight bosons. And uh, optomechanical system then uh, seem to be uh, suitable for the detection of, of such field, because in the end, the problem will just be to detect um, a force, like a, an oscillating signal that will act on your mirror. And this force, of course, is going to be uh, a weak, coherent, uh, and uh, persistent, like a constant signal. So it is possible, in principle, to detect it. Of course, it's going to be difficult because the force is, uh, is extremely uh, small. So the effect also might be uh, difficult to distinguish from other environmental effects. And finally, um, you could also use uh, this um, general setup of optomechanical system uh, to detect, uh, for example, um, uh, modification to quantum mechanics, so to investigate the foundations, ex essentially. Uh, for example, collapse models are um, this theory, uh, unifying theory, that they uh, um, modify the Schrodinger equation by postulating that the collapse of the wave function is a physical effect, affecting uh, uh, all the systems, uh, from the microscopic to the macroscopic ones. These models uh, uh, are able to explain also the quantum to classical transition, and they solve uh, the measurement problem. The problem is that they are very difficult to test because uh, the, um, the effect is small, and it is almost impossible um, to, to, dis to discriminate. Uh, I mean, the, the result will be like um, an extra um, dissipative mechanism affecting your system. So it is difficult to, to say, okay, this dissipation, this decoherence comes from uh, this theory or from some unknown uh, other dissipative effect uh, I might not considering. So one way to test it is to use, again, an optomechanical system and to uh, model um, the effect of collapse as an extra force affecting the mirror. Then the collapse of the wave function will cause extra decoherence, and you can um, aim to detect uh, uh, this uh, this force that will be also weak and fluctuating. So um, these are uh, the three. Um, I mean, three of the examples uh, uh, we we thought it could be useful to to test in uh, such setup. Um, now I would like to, to talk a little bit how we can get an announcement. Since I said like all these signals are very weak and it is very difficult to distinguish them, even with mm, high uh, sensitive optomechanical platform, it will be good to find some way to get an announcement. And uh, in general, uh, we know that uh, averaging data is a usually uh, is, a, is a common practice to reduce uh, random noise. So let's say uh, that we have a system that is subjected to some random noise, and we can describe the noise in terms of the uh, average and the statistical uh, um, and the variance. So when we have uh, n samples of our system, we can uh, average the noise. 
So we can take the expectation by the, the average of X, where X identify uh, our noise. And then if we also um, average the, the variance uh, associated to this noise, we will see that uh, there is a scaling factor of uh, one over square root of n. It will make the variance of the average smaller than the variance of the single uh, sample. And this is important because uh, this will, um, uh, we see that when we look at the signal to noise ratio, so the ratio between the variances of the system and the noise, this will improve when we take the average of n samples. And it is known as uh, this scaling that goes like the square root of n is known as the standard quantum limit. Uh, moreover, people notice that in, instead of uh, having a system and performing uh, n different measurement, one could do the following things. One could take n copies of the same system and uh, on each of them perform uh, a, a single measurement and then take the average. So uh, something that creates a lot of excitement is the fact that um, if you correlate these probes, so all these copies of the system, and now we can call them probes, and if we create some correlations between them, some entanglement or some squeezing, it is possible to beat the standard quantum limit and to increase the signal noise ratio of another factor of a square root of n. So in total, uh, we will have factor n scaling uh, for the signal to noise ratio. And this is known as the Heisenberg limit. Now, this, of course, is like uh, something uh, uh, great and uh, extremely exciting for, for sensing uh, uh, weak signals. However, uh, there is a, a feasibility problem because uh, in general, if you want to create uh, um, some entanglement uh, probes, or you want to use these uh, quantum uh, resources, um, this will affect your experiment. And in particular, it will really confine the number n you can actually use. Because uh, these um, entangled and squeezed uh, probes will be highly subjected to the coherence. So in the end, even if theoretically you could extend this number to a very high value, then experimentally, you have also to counterbalance um, effects coming from the decoherence. And this will, uh, will uh, limit uh, uh, your number and sources. So, um, and this motivates uh, why we want to use coherent averaging. So in this picture here, we show the, the standard, uh, uh, it's a sketch of the standard average, where we have like uh, any different system, uh, row of theta, they depend on this parameter we aim to estimate. And on each of them, we perform a measurement. Then we take the average uh, of all these measurements. And this is, I mean, the standard uh, way of averaging. However, um, what it is also possible is to take n copies of your system and let them interact with a, a quant with a with a whole system with a single system for all the, the copies that it is called quantum bus and then perform a single measurement over the quantum bus so this is the uh, these are the steps for the coherent averaging and in this case uh, the phase information will also accumulate uh, in the total quantum bus and in, uh, in most of the cases, you will see that uh, uh, the signal to noise ratio will also scale with the number of uh, probes you have. The advantage is that uh, you will get this scaling even when you have uh, product states for your probes. So you don't need to use entanglement or squeezing or other um, uh, easily uh, subjected to decoherence uh, probes. So, uh, the other advantage then is that uh, these schemes is robust under the coherence. And okay, now I want to present uh, the, the system uh, that we want to use. So we want to use optomechanical systems and we want to mm, implement a coherent average scheme to enhance the sensitivity and detect one of these uh, fundamental forces I mentioned at the beginning. 
And uh, okay, by starting from a single uh, optomechanical cavity, uh, the idea is to inject some light in a cavity, and we can describe uh, uh, the input field and the output field uh, uh, in terms of uh, this B operator. And then we name differently the, 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 the field inside the cavity. Let's imagine now we have a, um, an, a signal, something that we don't know where it is, that is uh, modifying the motion of the mechanical mirror, described by this uh, operator Q. So by um, per, uh, injecting the light, letting it interact with the mirror, and then measuring the output light, we will be able to infer something about the modification of the mechanical mirror. And we can use then the, um, it, these are very uh, commonly used input-output relation to relate the output field uh, with the input field, the one that we know that we decide to inject in the cavity, and also the cavity, the, the field inside the cavity itself. So what happens when we have two cavities? Uh, and let's say that these two cavities are both subjected to the same uh, signal. Uh, in, in, in they, they are affected in the same way. So the input light field will go first into the first cavity. It will interact with the mirror. It will go out, and then it will direct the, into the, the second cavity. Then it interacts also with the second cavity. It goes out, and we detect this output field. The thing is that now we want to use as input field for the second cavity the output of the first one. And this comes with a certain uh, um, uh, delay, with a certain delay in time that uh, is due to the fact that the light, the output field from the first cavity has to travel an additional distance before entering the second cavity. So um, we need to take into account also this time delay between cavities that will let us uh, write um, the out the input field of the second cavity as the input sorry as the output field of the first but shifted in time and then again by iterating uh, the input output relation we are able to express the output field of the second cavity as the sum of the input field so the the light we decide to inject and then we have a sum of uh, fields that are in the cavities. So, this is the full scheme. Now we coupled and uh, cavities all together. The light is injected in the first one. It is. Uh, it will go through all the n cavities, and then finally it will be detected uh, at the end of the last cavity. So. Uh, the input-output relation uh, iterated uh, uh, n times uh, will give something similar, no? So it will give me the output field in terms of the input shifted uh, at the right uh, time. And then we will have contribution coming from uh, all the cavity fields. Now, um, this scheme is an unidirectional in the sense that the light goes from the first to the second until the last one um, without going back. So in this sense, it's uh, unidirectional. And uh, uh, if we compare it with a coherent average scheme, uh, the, la the laser um, assumes the, the role of the bus. So this is the, the common uh, um, uh, thing that we want to measure to gain information on the probes, and the probes are our uh, of the mechanical system. And a measurement of this uh, output light field will allow us to infer uh, something about the mechanical motion. And if we uh, find a modification uh, from what we would expect to this uh, motion, then we can also infer something about the, the signal we aim to detect. So um, just to give you uh, also the Hamiltonian of the system, uh, we are considering the, the, I mean, the system, the, the Hamiltonian will just be a sum over all the um, optomechanical cavities. And for each of them, we have uh, the Hamiltonian for the optomechanical system. So the free Hamiltonian for the mechanics, 
the free Hamiltonian for the cavity field, and the optomechanical interaction. Then we also have to consider the input field that consists of uh, many modes. And the interaction uh, between the input field and the cavity field. And this we model it as uh, just beam splitter interaction. So uh, then with the Hamiltonian, uh, what you have to do is to solve the Lanzivan equation and uh, to obtain the solution uh, for the cavity field, the input field, and the optomechanical uh, uh, resonator, the um, mechanical resonator for which we want to look at two different cases, as I mentioned before. So the case in which uh, we can consider the signal as a, uh, as a classical effect, and then uh, we, don't, we don't use the solution of the equation of motion, and uh, the case in which it is a quantum, uh, um, when we also want to include the quantum sources of noise. And OK, I also want to. Um, make a comment on the kind of source we want to use. Uh, we want to reach the stroboscopic regime. And uh, we, we want to use a, a, um, a pulse, a Gaussian laser pulse, that is centered around the, the frequency of the pulse omega p. And uh, uh, it is, uh, it, this pulse lasts uh, tau. So the width uh, in frequency of this pulse is 1 over tau. And um, it will, of course, also depend on the number of uh, photons uh, that uh, we inject in the in the input field. Uh, we want this pulse uh, to be long enough, in the sense uh, that we want it to be um, uh, long respect to the cavity. So kappa is the cavity decay rate, and we want this to be larger than the width of your uh, Gaussian pulse. And you also want uh, uh, the mechanical resonator to move slower than uh, the pulse. And uh, finally, you also want the, the cavity field to be faster than the mechanics. So in the end, the mechanical resonator will be the slowest. Uh, then uh, there will be the, um, uh, the pulse and then uh, the uh, cavity field. In the initial state we want to consider, so as initial condition, we, we say, okay, for our input laser, we just use a product of a coherent state that are displaced in this way. We assume that the, all the cavities are empty at the beginning, but uh, we assume also that uh, the mechanical resonators have already been displaced, so they are already moving, because of the signal that is affecting them. So we are assuming that the mechanical resonators, each of them, is in a displaced thermal state. And now uh, we go to the um, parameter estimation uh, part. So uh, to do that, we need to use uh, tools that come uh, from uh, the quantum info fissure information. Because we know that uh, when we want to estimate the, the variance of a certain parameter epsilon, we need to compute the quantum Fisher information because this will give us a lower bound to the variance. Uh, and this is known as the kramer how bound. In the very special case that we are dealing with pure states and Gaussian states, the quantum Fisher information is quite uh, easy to, to write and to calculate. Uh, because um, uh, we uh, we know that for Gaussian states we can just use the statistical moments, no? So we have the first moment that is also called displacement vector, and it is just the the average of your operators. And then the second moment uh, uh, that is represented by the sigma, uh, it corresponds to the covariance matrix. So in this case, the quantum Fisher information is easy. It's just a, a combination of derivative with respect to the parameter we aim to estimate of uh, both the first and the second moment. And in, um, in our case, we want to look at the classical signal uh, in the sense that we consider as a, a solution from the equation of motion uh, just a function uh, an oscillating function that will depend on some phase phi 
and an amplitude Q. And the goal is to estimate this amplitude that will give us the displacement um, caused by the, uh, the, the known signal. So in this case, it is enough to just have a look at the amplitudes. And for this, we can uh, look at the uh, first moment, then at the displacement vector. That for, uh, for our case, um, in which we are dealing with a continuum of modes, it's uh, an infinite dimensional uh, vector. But we can, uh, we can assume that in this case, the covariance matrix is just the identity. Therefore, uh, the only things we need to calculate is the expectation value of the output field. And this leads us to um, a recursive relation. So um, this was the, the output field I gave you at the beginning in terms of the input field uh, plus a sum of all the fields in the different cavities. Now, we want to go to the frequency domain because eventually we would like to do spectral measurements. And um, this will it will be analogous to the time uh, expression. And we have the output field here, the input field, and a bunch of uh, cavity fields. However, we would like to just have the output field in terms of what we know, so in terms of the input field. And it is possible to obtain this uh, by uh, redefining this sum of cavity fields, obtaining a recursive uh, relation, and by solving it, we will get a solution, this alpha n, that essentially will depend only on the input field. So this will give us the relation of the output field, this uh, blue here, in terms only of uh, a sum of, um, I mean, a combination that depends only on the first input field. And uh, uh, where does the mechanical element uh, come? Uh, it is included in these two coefficients uh, that will include also the, um, the displacement uh, Q. And this is what we want to estimate. So in the ideal case, so no losses, we can consider uh, that the Fisher information will just be, the quantum Fisher information will simplify to this expression. And by taking the derivative with respect to Q, that is the amplitude of the mechanical motion, we get this formula here. And we see that uh, we actually get an announcement uh, scaling with the uh, power two of the optomechanical cavities. So what we would like to do is also to include uh, losses uh, between cavities to make the scenario a little bit more realistic. And uh, for doing that, we need to include losses uh, that can be modeled by a beam splitter. So in this case, the output field has to be reshaped as the output field dumped by this eta, and we need to combine it with some uh, vacuum field. Again, by using the input-output relations for the output field, and combining with the time delay that will uh, use the input field as the one of the previous cavity shifted in time, we are able to obtain a recursive relation also in the dissipative case. And, um, and we can see this here, where uh, it is analogous to the previous one, but we have now this eta dependency that comes here, but also in these new coefficients. So the quantum Fisher information uh, has this form, and we see again that there is an announcement as, uh, that scales with uh, n squared, but also there is a factor uh, depending on uh, eta to the power to n that uh, will cause uh, the Fisher to decrease. So when we include losses, uh, we have a, um, we have two effects: an announcement uh, that arises from the fact that we increase the number of cavities. But also we have a detrimental effect that comes from the um, increasing losses. So it's the interplay between these two effects that will eventually give us um, a total announcement. I mean, the, the, the goal is to find the balance between uh, extending the number of cavities that will give you an announcement and not making it too large because then losses will overcome and you will lose the announcement. 
So, and uh, finally, I also want to uh, discuss briefly what happens when we include uh, quantum noise. In this case, we need to study uh, correlations uh, uh, for our uh, displacement vector. So, uh, we need to go to the second moment. We have to calculate the covalence matrix. And essentially, now we have an infinite vector for our displacement vector. And also, the covalence matrix consists of many different terms. And uh, we are still in the, in the process of uh, working this out, but essentially um, here the, the goal is to calculate each terms that are of this form. So we have correlations of the output field. And uh, uh, the, the, um, what we want to include is, uh, of course, to write the, the output field by using the input-output correlations. But in this case, we have uh, the full solution of the equation of motion for the cavity field, the input field, and also the mechanical oscillator. Therefore, uh, we can have the um, cavity field split in three parts, where we have um, the zero order terms are in the optomechanical uh, zero in the optomechanical coupling G, and then first of uh, order the other terms of the first order uh, that are uh, respectively uh, responsible for two different effects, the uh, thermal noise and the light back action. So same for uh, C, we'll see in this case uh, corresponds to the uh, mode operator for the mechanical motion. You can have uh, uh, zero order terms in G and first order terms. When you neglect the first order terms in both of these operators, then you will recover the classical uh, uh, signal case. And um, so the, what we are looking at at the moment is to uh, see if this thermal dissipation and light back action um, cause a um, detrimental effect to the quantum fissure. And in particular, we would like to estimate how big are these effects to see if there is still an announcement. And uh, with this, I, I conclude. So to sum up, um, I presented you a system that employs uh, several optomechanical cavities for uh, fencing of uh, weak small forces. And we combine uh, this with uh, uh, the coherent average scheme for which we know that in the ideal case, we lead to announcement scaling with and square and uh, that in the lost cases, uh, there is a detrimental effect uh, that goes like uh, eta to the power 2n. Uh, and finally, to have a, a complete uh, view of, uh, of the situation, we also must include the thermal noise and the light back action. And I mean, an estimation of how big this noise uh, is going to be will give us the answer on if we can still get an advantage or uh, not. So, uh, yes, this is all. Uh, with this, I conclude, and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, now we'll open to questions. I'll start with, um, uh, do you know, so you kept this very general in terms of um, uh, uh, just a general array of mechanical oscillators, but um, do you have any, uh, have you guys looked into or have any idea about which sp specific uh, uh, optomechanical setups you might be able to implement yeah. this? Yeah. Um, uh, no, not really. Like uh, we just model it for this uh, light interacting with mirrors. But yeah, yeah. of course it is true that um, uh, there are, many <laughs> optomechanical system that uh, probably are very sensitive. Um, I think also the choice of the setup uh, can be done according to then the specific model you want to study. Mm. Because uh, probably uh, according to the fact you want to, to detect, uh, you might prefer choosing a, a certain setup rather than another one. Mm. It maybe has to be uh, specified, like restricting the analysis to uh, what we want to look at. I don't know, for example, if we are... Yeah, yeah. for example, like with gravitational wave detection, you want as massive as possible, whereas um, yes. for CSL, that's not the case. So. Mm -hmm. 
No, at the moment, we just want to see if there is this announcement, because if there is, then we can uh, tailor it. I mean, uh, yeah, make it more specific, but uh, we want to see if uh, this is a general feature. And yeah, yeah. No, and it's it's good because then it um, generally applies to any array of mechanical oscillators. Mm -hmm. And do you know what, um, uh, maybe you touched on this briefly, but for the loss case of the efficiency, um, uh, do you know what, um, what what values that efficiency might take or that loss? Uh, um, as a number? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know, but uh, so if we look at the, I don't have a number in mind, uh, sorry, but. But I suppose I, then you can, I suppose you, it, it would give an indication of um, how efficient you need the system to be in order for the enhancement to. I think you need something very efficient because uh, this is either is the transmission rate. Yeah, because it, it exponentially suppressed, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and then if you look at the feature, you get to like uh, uh, these two factors. So the enhancement yeah. goes like uh, the power two of n. Yeah, so x squared times constant to the power n. Yeah, so you would really need high, if it really like 0.95 or high, yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah something. Uh, something very efficient uh, in terms of transmission rate. Uh, you want this to be closer to one. Yeah, right. That's interesting. All right. Um, do we have any other I questions? I think it is possible. I don't know. I think um, at least uh, my understanding is that these sensors are kind of um, well um, established experimentally. So I don't think this will be a massive problem. Mm. Yeah, yeah. As in, um, optomechanical efficiencies are very good at the mm. moment. Yeah. Um, all right. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, yeah. Hi. Thanks, Marta. Uh, can you go back to the initial state of the oscillators that you took? Here. Yeah. And... So if we look at this setup as an array of oscillators, so the initial state should make a difference. I was expecting that if it is a coherent state to see an enhancement in the signal proportional to alpha node mode square. Do we see something like that or? Um, sorry, can you repeat? Like uh, uh, if we, so this is the state? Of the resonator that is already the yes. signal, and you would yes. So if we take it to be a coherent state for each of the oscillators, mm -hmm. then would would you expect the signal to scale as the mode square of alpha naught? Mm. I. Uh, uh, I'm not sure because uh, in this case we're taking a displaced thermal state then we are assuming that all of them are affected in the same way all of the oscillators okay I was trying to draw this analogy with this case of an array of harmonic oscillators mm -hmm. each of them coupled to a common mode and uh, we look into whether the array shows super radiance or not. I, I think so. Yeah, I think in this case, we are considering that they, all, they, they will all oscillate with the same phase. Okay. So I don't know if, um, I don't know, like a, a signal that uh, will affect them uh, in a different way, for example, even in time, might affect the, um, the announcement. Okay. So the, the the assumption in this case is uh, let's say that there is this signal that uh, excited all the oscillator in the same way. So they're all oscillating uh, with this function. Okay. But one could also think of uh, I don't know, like a particle passing by. So exciting uh, first the first oscillator, then the second, and so on. Yeah. And. 
does it make a difference uh, as to how quantum is the state of the laser because uh it it needs to be a quantum bus so does it matter how quantum the bus is um so i think um, about the laser uh we want it to be strong mm -hmm. because we want it to interact with uh, with our optomechanical cavity um and we want it to be uh, um uh, the, the the pulse has to be long enough because if it's too short, it will just uh, enter and exit the cavity, so it will be reflected. You know, yeah. you want actually to the pulse to be uh, long such that it will interact with the with the whole cavity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I think this is the constraint we want. I mean, uh, uh, intensity uh, and uh, that will interact with the cavity. Because, uh, for example, with just a coherent light, um, I'm not sure. Like we will have to wait for the um, stable uh, uh, state to be reached. And I don't know about the announcement in this case if we will still see it. Okay, thanks. Um, so to clarify, when you say that the pulse has to be long with respect to the cavity, is that the um, the A cavities? Um, which uh, so the cavity field? The cavity field. So that's the one which touches the mechanical mirror. Yes. Okay. So we uh, another we, question. We did. I mean, we consider like this input field. Uh, as an external field, and then the one inside the cavity is the one that couples with the mechanical uh, um, resonator. Uh, in the, I can show it in the Miltonian. So the A operator and the Q enter here. Mm -hmm. And then you have the interaction between the input field that is B and the A is the cavity field. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, another question also is, um, I'm not entirely familiar with everything that goes in an optomechanical field, but the light back action, um, is that first order in G or would that be second order in G? It uh, yes, feels uh, like it should be second. It's, uh, it's uh, actually second, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, because it's, um, uh, when we split this contribution that I call the zero and the first order, it's a, uh, Sorry, it is slow. Uh, right. So here, no, next one, probably. Okay, so here I said that this is first order in G, but uh, it is actually true, it is uh, second order in G because when, um, by solving, I mean, you see that uh, you have a, um, a that will depend also on the mechanical part, and uh, the mechanical part will depend also again on the uh, B field, the input field. So in the end, you will get the factor G squared. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, that, that answers all my questions. Yep. All right. So if there's no more questions, um, thank you, Marta, for coming along today. It was a really interesting talk. And um, yeah, so our next uh, seminar will be in a couple of weeks and the announcement will, that will go out soon.